Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Today we'll discuss the mental skills that you need to defeat the dangerous judgment errors that are known as cognitive biases, including the confirmation bias and over a hundred other problems that cause us to make pretty bad decisions that lead to disasters in our professional life and personal life. Now, first, let's start by talking about what are cognitive biases themselves. Well, these are errors, like I said, that come from the fact that our mind is wired in a way that's really problematic, actually. It causes us to take a lot of mental shortcuts that lead to bad decisions. Now, they were useful in the savanna environment when we you when we lived in the ancestral tribal environment because our gut intuitions, our reactions, our intuitive reactions are adapted for the savanna environment. They're not adapted for the modern world. And that's why we make these over a hundred dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. Now, the confirmation bias is the most well-known of these cognitive biases. It does two things. It, first of all, leads us to look for information in a way that confirms our pre-existing beliefs. That's first. Second, it causes us to interpret any new information we see, whether we look for it or we don't look for it, in a way that conforms to our pre-existing beliefs. So that, that's the confirmation bias. Now, we fall into the confirmation bias and other cognitive biases when we follow our gut reactions. Now, for example, let's uh, in our everyday life, in our modern life, we treat every bad piece of news that we get as though it's a terrible, terrible thing. We react disproportionately to how bad it is because our gut reactions are adapted for the savanna environment, for the ancestral tribal environment, where it was very important for us to react very strongly to any potential bad news, because it was better to jump at a hundred shadows than to fail to jump at one saber-toothed tiger, which is why the it's known as the saber-toothed response, also known as the fight-or-flight response. So we either fight the saber-toothed tiger or we flee from it or whatever it is, you know. So that's the fight or flight response, and that's why we tend to overreact to problems. Let's say an email sent by one of your direct, direct reports that tells you that, you know, something problematic is going on. Now, I remember getting one such email from one of my employees telling me that a major deal that I was working on is really not, <laughs> not doing so hotly. So that was pretty bad. I was pretty upset. I was pretty mad when I read the email. And my gut reaction was to blame the employee for these bad news, for this bad news, because the employee brought me the bad news. Now, fortunately, I was aware of the confirmation bias, as well as another cognitive bias that's called the mom effect or the shoot the messenger effect, where we tend to blame people for bad news when they bring us the bad news, regardless of whether they're implicit in causing the bad news. Not a good thing in the organizational settings. So I calmed down. I calmed down. I calmed my anger down. Took the time to do so using the strategies that we'll talk about in a bit. And I thought about the situation. I realized that, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I had an inkling that there might be a serious problem with the deal that I negotiated. But I wasn't I just wasn't looking for that information. I was just kind of flinching away from that information, from these ideas, and I didn't want to disrupt my happy, pleasant thoughts and everyday experiences by going and looking into that potentially bad information. Yeah. <laughs> Not fun, right? So that's an example of the confirmation bias, where we tend not to look for information that would disconfirm our beliefs, the beliefs that are comfortable to us, pleasant beliefs. So we tend to not look for this information, and that's the confirmation bias, and I fell into it as well. Now, we yield to the confirmation bias whenever we, look f whenever we fail to look for, for information that challenges our pleasant beliefs, such as I did with a deal, or when we get angry at the person sending us the information because we don't want to hear this information and we reject the information, such as I got initially angry at the employee who sent the email, or when we flinch away from negative reality of and denied. So I got angry at the email and that was uh, the fight response. Now I tend to be the kind of person who has this fight response. There are plenty of other people who have more of the flight response and the flight response would tend to be just ignoring the email saying blah 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 I can't hear you nothing happened <laughs> you know uh, and so ignoring the negative reality. I'm more of the fight response type so in the ancestral savanna I would have probably been a warrior so I would have reacted 
with a fight response to either the saber tooth tiger or enemy warriors attacking our tribe. So likely <laughs> I wouldn't have I wouldn't have lived that long. But if I did live for a while because I was a successful warrior and you kind of got into the chief war leader position, I probably would have passed on my genes to a lot of people. So for example, the famous war leader Genghis Khan of the Mongols, we know from research that his genes are found in about 5% of the world's population. So, you know, you look around you, one out of 20 people is likely to have his genes. So that's how these warrior fight genes tend to be passed on to the current generation. And so that's, we are the descendants of people who had this fight response, as well as some of the people who chose to flee and had the flight response. So that's the ancestral tribal environment. In the modern environment, it doesn't serve us well. Now the much more effective response to getting bad news at work, at work is to calm down, analyze the news, talk about it with the subordinate who brought you the bad news, and take next steps to resolve the problem. Calm next steps, not aggressive. Accept the information, internalize it, take the next steps that are necessary to resolve the problem. And that's what I ended up doing. So I didn't, you know, yell and shout to, uh, at the other party that was kind of not going along with the deal. Instead, I talked to the other party and we figured out an alternative deal that wasn't quite as good for me, uh, for my company, but it still was much better than nothing. So it w ended up working out well overall, even though the deal wasn't originally as good as it could have been. But plenty of other people who would have had the fight response to this and reacted to the confirmation bias badly by having the fight response, they would have ended up shouting at the other party and there would have definitely been no deal. Or they would have ignored this information, kind of just went on in their day, whatever, blah, 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 you know, ignoring this negative information and there would have been no deal either. But the confirmation bias, by fighting the confirmation bias, I was actually able to secure a deal. And I hope you will as well through the strategies that I'm going to describe. Too many business leaders, unfortunately, fall for the confirmation bias. So there's, a re there's extensive research. For example, there's one study of over a thousand board members of organizations that fired their CEOs, their chief executive officers. And the study found that 23% of the board members cited denying negative facts about the company, about the market, about the state of the situation, about the state of things as a major reason for why the CEO was fired. So that's 23%. That's a pretty big number showing you the negative impact of the confirmation bias for, for the current business reality and for the chief executive officers of major companies where the board members were interviewed. Now, tragically, <laughs> Prominent business gurus, self-help gurus, you know, those firewalking gurus, they advocate for you to actually go with your gut intuitions and fall into all of these over 100 cognitive biases. Why is that? Why do they tell you to go with your gut and making decisions and not go with your head? Well, because going with our gut is very comfortable to us. It's very intuitive. So it feels good. And, you know, they tell you what feels good and then they get paid. People get paid for telling you what feels good to you for you to do, right? Big news, right? <laughs> so that's how they make their money. That's unfortunate, but it's true. I'm not going to tell you the things that feel good necessarily. I'm going to tell you the things that are true, accurate, and will actually help your bottom line, help your relationships, help your personal life, help you achieve your goals instead of doing the things that are comfortable and intuitive and feel good. So instead of following those primal intuitive instincts and going with your gut, I really, really, really recommend that you go with your head and analyze the situation carefully before you take steps that cause you to ignore important information or look for information that just confirms your beliefs or fall into one of, and that's the confirmation bias, or fall into over one of over a hundred other cognitive biases. And that's how you attain your goals. Now, you might be surprised by the term, by the term I used of primal instincts and the converse, the opposite of doing the civilized thing of going with your head. Now, what does civilized mean? What does primal mean, first of all? Primal means basic, intuitive, primitive, savage. It's our intuitions. It's our gut reactions. It's the authentic selves. It's what we naturally want to do. What does civilized mean? Civilized simply means learned behaviors. It means that we're not in that primal savage state 
and that tribal environment, it means that we have learned to do things that don't go along with our intuitions and we have become civilized. And that's what civilized means. And all of the things that I'm talking about here are the civilized things to do. Going with your head is the civilized thing to do. Going with your gut is the intuitive, natural, primal thing to do. So don't do the primal thing. Don't do the primitive thing. Do the civilized thing. Do the learned thing. Go with your head. Analyze things correctly. And that's what civilized people should do. And I hope you should, you would do that as well, because that's what's really important in our modern business environment to do the civilized things. Now, civilized behaviors come from structured methods of thinking and decision making. And I talk about structured methods of thinking and decision making extensively in my work. So there's extensive, lots of structured decision making processes that I describe that would both help you make the best decisions and implement them most effectively. However, plenty of time, we don't have the opportunity to do the structured decision-making process or even realize that it's necessary. So besides the structured decision-making processes, and there'll be some links in the show notes to the structured decision-making processes, you need to develop some mental skills. And that's what I was talking about in the beginning, the mental skills and habits that you need to develop to address confirmation bias and other cognitive biases. So these mental skills, these habits, they are things that you internalize into your everyday activities. Just like you learned how to uh, talk, let's say. That's a civilized learned activity. Just like you learned to brush your teeth. Just like you learned not to interrupt others. Just like you learned to delegate things effectively. Just like you learned to communicate well with your colleagues. These are all the 12 mental skills that I'll talk about are similar things that recent research has shown are very important in fighting the confirmation bias and over a hundred other dangerous judgment errors. Now, when you learn these skills and integrate them into your everyday activities, which will take a while, but it's definitely doable and effective. And I've seen plenty of my coaching and consulting clients do so quite effectively. And of course I do so and plenty of other people I know. Here are the things that I can tell you that you'll gain from doing so. Now, these abilities will enable, will enable you to predict when you or someone else is about to fall into one of these cognitive biases. So that predict and prevent, hopefully prevent that problem from happening. So it will definitely enable you to be much more likely to predict. And then with that knowledge, you're much more likely to be able to prevent that problem from happening. Now, it will help you recognize very, very quickly when dangerous judgment errors are undermining whatever is going on in the situation at hand, in your professional life, in your personal life, and whatever. Even if you didn't predict it beforehand, you'll be able to notice and see, aha, the confirmation bias is happening. Or, aha, you know, the planning fallacy is happening. The planning fallacy is our tendency to assume that our plans are wonderful and will just have, go according to plan. Or, you know, aha, the shoot the messenger is happening when people are, again, blamed for negative information that they brought to the situation. Not good. So they'll be able to enable you to see what's happening, even if they didn't predict it beforehand. Now, they'll also help you recognize and um, take steps in the moment that you need to take, even when you didn't have time to predict them, to address these dangerous judgment errors, whether the confirmation bias or over 100 other dangerous judgment errors, you'll be able to take the steps that you need in the moment to address whatever is going on. So not so, even if you didn't predict it, which is, I mean, it's kind of hard to predict sometimes. Sometimes it can. Sometimes it's kind of hard. So you need to react in the moment instantaneously to the presence of one of these dangerous judgment errors. And you'll be able to teach others in your organization, your professional network, you know, all the people you care about, you know, personal life, of course, to be able to spot these mental blind spots and protect themselves from it by predicting, noticing, and preventing these dangerous judgment errors, these cognitive biases from impacting them negatively. So these are the mental skills. So what they will enable you to do. Now let's talk about the mental skills themselves. Skill one, identify and plan. That's the first skill. So first we need to identify the various dangerous judgment errors that are happening in the situation in your life, for you personally, in others, in your organization, in your relationships, whatever's going on. And then you need to make a plan to address them. Now, gaining awareness of the problem, the dangerous judgment error, whether it's the confirmation bias or over 100 other cognitive biases, is the first step to solving it. 
sounds obvious, right? However, debiasing, getting rid of these cognitive biases, by the, uh, is much harder than it seems. And debiasing, by the way, is a term that scholars in cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics like myself use for addressing cognitive biases. So you'll see this term thrown around by in the scholarship. And so that's the term is, again, debiasing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just read a book or listen to a speech or listen to a show much like this one and learn about these over 100 cognitive biases and then voila, you're cured. It's like magic, right? doesn't work that way, unfortunately. I, I wish it did. <laughs> Lots of people wish it did, but it doesn't. So just learning about these cognitive biases according to extensive research doesn't really help you much. It helps you a little bit, but it doesn't help you much in addressing these cognitive biases. That's just the way they work, unfortunately. So research shows that just finding out about a cognitive bias, unfortunately, doesn't have much impact in addressing the problem. I wish it did, uh, but um, it does somewhat, it does a little bit, but it doesn't have that much impact on it. Now, learning about these mental blind spots is crucial, crucial, very, very important, highly, highly important, but then you need to take other steps based on your knowledge of this information in order to really address them, to overcome them. Just simply finding out about them is not enough. Now, understanding the stakes, so the first step is really understanding the stakes for you and for other people who are in your organization, in your personal life, wherever, whoever you're helping with cognitive biases. And of course, the first person you should help with the confirmation bias and other cognitive biases is yourself. So the first thing is to identify where and how in your life and their lives is it actually damaging you? Is it hurting you? Is it causing you a lot of pain? Why is that important? Well, because the gut reactions are emotional. And research shows that our emotions, our intuitions, our gut reactions, just intuitively, they drive about 80 to 90% of what we do. And it's not a bad thing. We, we want to be able to be driven, be motivated. And a lot of things that we do are on autopilot. You know, I'm talking to you right now and I'm talking to you. I'm not thinking about the way I'm pronouncing each word, right? I'm just doing it. It's automatic. And that's kind of driven by my in emotions, what I've internalized. And so you need to internalize into your emotions the dangers of these cognitive biases, the dangers of the confirmation bias and other dangerous judgment errors. And in order to then be able to effectively get your emotions on board with actually solving them by doing the counterintuitive behaviors that it takes to solve these problems. So because it's just very hard to do these counterintuitive things. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, you might be surprised by me calling it hard, but have you ever tried? I mean, when's the last time you tried to do a counterintuitive thing? It's really, re it's about rewiring your instincts. You know, let's say, of, you know, you're trying to learn how to, learn how to drive a car, right? The, you, you've done that. You've learned how to, how to drive a car. Doing that is hard. Do you remember the time when you started doing it? You know, I mean, maybe this age is me, but way back when I remember there was one thing that was super, super hard to learn how to do for me because it was very counterintuitive. And that was to not slam on the brake because we didn't have anti-lock brakes back then, but not slam on the brake when I was skidding. So on ice or on water, snow, not slam on the brake, but instead pump the brake. Pumping the brake is very hard work. It's very counterintuitive. It's very uncomfortable. And just, it seems it's very intuitive to just slam on the brake. So learning to do that took a lot of effort and it's hard and it's not comfortable to do. It goes against our intuitions. So it's just as counterintuitive. Or let's say another thing, you know, how easy is it to go out and do exercises? I've, I mean, I do exercise every day. I hope you do as well. You know, 30 minutes of light exercise every day, right? Very important. It's what the doctor ordered for our health, right? But it's hard to do. It's very uncomfortable to especially start doing them. Once you get into a habit of doing them, it's much easier. And once you get into a habit of, of uh, you know, driving your car and not slamming on the brakes when you're, you're skidding, it's much easier. So eventually, as you build up these mental habits, it'll become much easier. But for now, it's going to be, as you're learning, it's going to be just as hard as motivating yourself to do exercises or just as hard as, you know, it is to not take that third cookie. You know, a second cookie is a okay, so that's all great. But third cookie is no good. 
<laughs> anyway, so it's hard to do those things. It's counterintuitive. Developing these skills is a form of mental fitness. Just as not taking that third cookie and doing your exercises is a form of physical fitness. You're doing it so you're physically healthy. And you're addressing these dangerous judgment errors so you have mental fitness, so that you're mentally healthy. So it's a form of mental fitness and well-being that's just as important as your physical fitness. If you do exercises every day, you should be doing this mental fitness, integrating these mental habits into your activities every day. Your mental fitness, your mental well-being is so much more important than binging out on Netflix or you know, scrolling Facebook or reading another depressing political news story. So you know, think about what time you can cut from those things and others to protect your mental fitness and improve your mental fitness and help you make the best decisions to avoid disasters in your professional life and your personal life. Choose carefully what you pay attention to, what you focus on, because what you focus on is really what you're pulling yourself toward, what you're becoming, what your identity is about. The only things in life we can control are our thoughts, our, our behaviors, what we do, and in the end, our feelings, our intuitions, our emotions. We can change those, although it takes time. And these mental habits, they're about changing your feelings, your emotions, your intuitions, to be aligned with civilized, learned behaviors which you've, of course, learned to do in many other areas like driving up a car or eating with a fork. That's not a civilized behavior, right? Eating with a fork and knife. We used to eat with our hands. And as babies, we ate with our hands. But we learned how to eat with a fork and knife. So these are the same sort of civilized behaviors of mental fitness. Now, to develop these skills and rewire mental habits requires us to really want to do it, to invest our emotions into doing it. And to invest our emotions into doing it, we need to understand how the confirmation bias and other cognitive biases are causing us to suffer. We need to understand these things in our lives. So again, simply learning about them doesn't create such feelings. What we need to do is identify very specifically, very thoroughly and very clearly points in our lives, points in the past in our lives, when these dangerous judgment errors caused us to have a really negative situation, have a really bad experience, really hurt us. So think about back to past decisions that you've made that you regret now, and think about how much they hurt you, and how they could have been much better off if you had not fallen into whatever error happened that caused you to make that bad decision. Now, there are, that's an example of how you would do it, now, there is fortunately, you, don't, you know, you don't have to think through every specific situation. There is an assessment on the 30 most dangerous judgment errors in the workplace that I developed. So there are over 100, like I said, and you know, something that some people do is read through each of the 100 uh, cognitive biases and look for it in their lives and see how it hurt them in their lives. And I, I'm, that's a good strategy to do. I narrowed it down to the 30 most dangerous ones and focused on the specific behaviors that you'll see in the workplace that you and your team in the workplace can do and take it and see how it impacts your workplace, your organization. And so that's a very effective tool to see and identify and specifically even get the specific numbers, dollars on the page are of how it hurts you and how it causes you damage. And that's going to be linked in the show episode notes. But that's really not enough. <laughs> Even identifying the problems is not enough. Why? Well, if you identify the problems, it's kind of like really disliking how uh, your weight. Let, let's go with that. So we're talking about cookies and we're talking about exercise. It's like you really don't like how you look and your current weight and you want to lose weight and you want to become more fit. So you want to do, you know, not take that third cookie and you want to do a lot more exercise. Good thing to do, right? But if you don't know how to do it, you don't make a concrete plan, it's very unlikely that you'll do it. You'll just be, kind of become sad and depressed and you'll eat more cookies to feel better. <laughs> Not that I ever did that, of course, but, you know, uh, it, it happens. I never did that, never. <laughs> anyway, so what you need to do is develop a specific and concrete plan for how you will address these dangerous judgment errors. So how you will increase your mental fitness just as you're increasing your physical fitness. And to help yourself and your team improve your mental fitness and avoid these dangerous judgment errors, make much better decisions, avoid business disasters that follow, there are, you can integrate the 12 mental fitness skills that I'm talking about here 
and this was just the first of these 12 mental fitness skills, as well as the structured decision-making processes into your everyday organizational policy. And, and again, those are linked in the episode notes. So let's talk about the second skill, delay decision-making. A great deal of the biasing, a great deal of the techniques to solve cognitive biases have to do with delaying our decision-making, slowing it down, delaying it, taking the time to address these dangerous judgment errors through thinking about them calmly. So like I reacted with the email, I didn't just immediately blast my subordinate or go to the other party in the deal and start shouting and yelling. I delayed, I took the time to think about what's going on and to address the subordinate calmly and address the other party calmly. So a really good technique here is for relatively minor things, you know, you're stressed out about an email to just count to 10, you know, our mother was right, your mother was right, you know, just counting to 10 and will get you calmer and will help you react more intentionally. It will be very helpful, really. Like that's a research-based strategy. That's something that really works to address the dangerous judgment errors that can cause us to make really bad responses in the moment. Now, that works for uh, somewhat minor things. When you have a stronger emotional arousal, it takes more time. It doesn't take 10 seconds. It takes more time to address it. So there's a thing called the to switch from the gut analysis to the head analysis, there's a thing that it's called the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the system of our mind that is activated when we have the fight or flight response. So it's also called, so that's the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system takes about 20 to 30 minutes to activate after that system. Uh, uh, so this, the sympathetic nervous system shoots adrenaline, cortisol, these are stress hormones for our body, getting us ready for fight or flight in response to some kind of really bad news at work or something like that. You don't want the, to respond by you know, fighting or fleeing. You want to take 20 to 30 minutes to calm down and respond calmly. And that's where you would take the time to delay, sit in a quiet, calm place, take the time to address the problem, think about it calmly. And that's when the parasympathetic nervous system, also called the rest and digest system, turns on. What's really helpful in turning on that system and also in greatly increasing your ability to focus on your responses and to be aware of your responses, which is very important in addressing these dangerous judgment errors, is mindfulness meditation. You might not know, you might be surprised that I'm talking about mindfulness meditation in this really research-based uh, context. But mindfulness meditation has been researched for a while and there are a number of forms of it that I can strongly recommend that have been shown to be highly effective in addressing dangerous judgment errors. Now, why does it help? It helps partially because of a combination of delays. So when you're doing meditation, you're sitting and focusing on your breathing, for example. That's one of the forms of meditation that has been most studied and shown to be highly effective. Just sitting down, focusing on your breathing, being calm. You're delaying yourself from responding immediately and you're learning how to focus. If you're just focusing on your breathing, it's kind of hard to focus on your breathing because you're, it's tempting to think about other things, worries at work, worries at home, worries in your, I don't know, church, worries in your civic community, it's tempting. But if you learn how to keep bringing your mind back from these stray thoughts to your breathing, that's a very useful skill that helps you notice and address dangerous judgment errors. So that's mindfulness meditation. That's the third skill. The fourth skill, probabilistic thinking. This is a big one. Our autopilot system, the gut reactions, which is the autopilot system, doesn't do well with numbers, abstract analysis. It's a yes or no system, black and white, binary thinking. So using probabilistic thinking, which is also called Bayesian reasoning after the founder of, um, after the person who discovered the Bayesian theorem, Reverend Thomas Bayes, it basically involves evaluating what is the probability of various outcomes by putting numbers on them. Not saying yes or no, but saying, you know, there's a 33% chance of this happening, and there's a 55% chance of this happening, and there's an 80% chance of this happening. And having using this more rational assessment where you apply various numbers 
to your evaluations of reality, you can update your beliefs about the world as more information becomes available. So, you know, let's say about this deal, when the employee sent the email, you know, I had a pretty low estimate that the deal was going to happen, you know, 10%. And then as I talked to the person, the other party in the deal, and we figured out that we could, um, you know, if we renegotiate some things in their favor, that party's favor, we can actually make the deal. No, my estimate of the deal's likelihood kept rising and rising. So that's an example of how you use probabilistic thinking. Or let me give you another example from my life. Say your business partner says something that you find hurtful. So, you know, you know for example, wow, our electric bill is so high this month. Let's say they, they say that and you know that you're the person who has the, uh, the thermostat set high because you'd like it to be warmer and your partner likes it to be cooler, but you know, they went with you and they set the thermostat high. And so you intuitively want to kind of, you know, respond to that. And a fight response would be saying something like, well, let's say that uh, your business partner didn't bring in as much business this month as, you know, they usually do. So you could say something, you know, hurtful, like, well, we wouldn't have to worry about the electric bill if you brought in more business. That um, drama follows, right? Not good. <laughs> you don't want that situation to happen. By contrast, probabilistic thinking will lead you to assess the probability that your partner wanted to hurt you with that statement, you know, and look for evidence that they're actually trying to hurt you. So, for example, you can ask, did you mean to say that the electric bill is so high because I leave the thermostat on and high? Is that what you meant to say? And then your business partner can answer, well, you know, last month you, the, you left the thermostat on high, you know, just as you did to the, this month. And the electric bill was, you know, was only a third of what it was right now. So it's probably something with the electric company. They probably screwed up something. Let me just call them and figure out what's going on. And then you find out to your surprise that your business partner didn't mean to hurt you. It was a completely different sort of situation. And yeah, and you avoid the drama. So that's a way that you avoid problems in your relationships by addressing the dangerous judgment errors that come from lacking probabilistic thinking, lacking the skill of probabilistic thinking. And that's actually a conversation. It's a version of the conversation that I had with my wife and business partner, Agnes Vishnevkin, last year during the winter. So I'm talking from my personal experience. I was tempted to say the thing about, you know, not bringing in the business, but I instead responded with, you know, what did you mean to say by that? You know, are you talking about thermostat? And, you know, she responded with the electric company and crisis averted. So that was really effective. So my question to Agnes reflects a really important aspect of probabilistic thinking, where you launch experiments to gain additional information because our gut reactions tend to be vastly, vastly overconfident about what reality actually looks like. So a cognitive bias, there's cognitive bias, it's called overconfidence effect, one of the over 100 cognitive biases, where we tend to be very, very overconfident about our estimates of reality. So in order to fight the overconfidence effect, what you want to do is launch experiments to see whether your estimates of reality are going to be right or not. Look for ways that you can test your theories. Especially, especially, especially look for ways of disproving your theories. Remember, the confirmation bias will test, will cause us to test the information in a way that only confirms our beliefs. What you want to do is to try to test the information in ways that disconfirms your beliefs. And if you can't disconfirm your belief, that's great. That means that you're much more likely to be accurate and you should go ahead with that business deal or whatnot. Now, another key aspect of probabilistic thinking is using your prior estimates of reality to inform your future assumptions about what's going on in the situation. It's called the base rate or the base rate probability. And it's also called the outside view. So you take the outside view on the situation. Let's say you're thinking about doing a merger and acquisition or an acquisition. An outside view, you might have an inside view of the situation and say, you know, I'm certain, very confident that this will be great because you are looking at the situation and you're, you like the other company that you're looking at, let's say to acquire. But what's the base rate? According to extensive research, about 70 to 90% of mergers end up destroying value, hurting the company rather than helping. So your outside view perspective, your base rate should be that the large majority, you know, of two out of three, more than two out of three 
acquisitions that you initially think are good are likely to be bad. More than two out of three, because nobody's going to launch an acquisition that they think will hurt the company. So everyone, all the business leaders who launched acquisitions thought that they were doing a good thing. They were thinking just like you, that, hey, this is a great buy for us. And in more than two out of three situations, it was a bad buy. Not good. So you want to have that assumption, say that, you know, this may be a great buy, this may be a bad buy, but it's likely to be the case that in more than two out of three situations, I'm going to assume that it's going to be a good buy when it's actually a bad buy. So have that as your base rate and evaluate the situation after you make that assumption and investigate it much more thoroughly than you would otherwise intuitively to see whether it's a good buy or not. So for example, you can launch an experiment. You can have a partnership with that company, you know, have a small partnership, do a project together, see how it works out. We tend to look at mergers and acquisitions. We tend to look very much at the externals of a company. What kind of patents do they have? What kind of, uh, what are their finances? What's their material wealth like? What kind of factories do they have or something like that? What, um, what's the external resumes of their people like if we want to do an acquihire, meaning an acquisition to hire the people in that company? We don't tend to look at the internals, which is the internal culture. What's their culture like? How similar is that culture to yours? We don't tend to look at that. And culture clashes are one of the biggest causes of failure of acquisitions and mergers. And that's why they one of the biggest causes of destroying value. The other huge cause is systems and processes. The one of the things that companies tend to vastly underestimate is the unique nature, the unusual nature of their internal systems and processes. Other companies are organized in a very different way. They often are organized in a very different way than you are. And it takes much more effort than you would imagine to combine your system and, and processes with their systems and processes if they tend, if you're quite incompatible to start with. You know, by random chance, you might be compatible. <laughs> by uh, you Don't take that chance. Look at their internal systems and processes. Look at how well you collaborate together. Evaluate their internal culture and their internal systems and processes before you decide to go forward with an acquisition or merge. Cool. Skill five, making predictions. Now, this is related to probabilistic thinking, but somewhat distinct from probabilistic thinking. What you want to do with this skill is be able to make predictions about the future of what's going on. Let's say you think your customers will be pleased if you send them a holiday card. So that's your assumption. You know, you're a small business owner, you want to send them holiday cards and you think they'll be pleased. Get a, get a batch of Thanksgiving cards and then separate out your customers into two equal piles with similar demographics. So let's say um, one of the customer bases you work with is financial advisors. Separate out all the financial advisors in similar demographics into two batches, an A batch and a B batch. To the A batch, you want to send out the Thanksgiving cards. To the B batch, you don't want to send out the Thanksgiving cards. And you want to make a prediction in advance with yourself. You don't need to do it with anyone else. What do you think will be the impact of sending out the Thanksgiving card? Will you get more referrals from the A batch than the B batch? Will you get more repeat business from the A batch than the B batch? How much more business? How much more referrals? Let's say you predict 10% more referrals and 15% more repeat business. Cool. Send out the Thanksgiving card or uh, you know, make a time estimate as well, just to be clear. Let's say within six months. And so make that estimate, send out the Thanksgiving card, See what happens in six months. Easy experiment. Doesn't cost you too much except sending out some Thanksgiving cards and tracking the responses. And then you'll know whether you should do the Thanksgiving cards or whether you shouldn't. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be 10. You don't have to hit those numbers 10%, 15%. Let's say you get 7% more referrals and 10% more repeat business. That might be sufficient for you. So you might want to decide that's enough and you keep doing the Thanksgiving cards or whatnot. That's great, that's fine. But you want to make a prediction in advance and see how well you match that prediction. And then based on the information you get, you might want to revise your activities. Maybe, you know, send a, I don't know, New Year's card or 
birthday cards if they have birthdays that might that'll be quite a bit harder if you have their birthdays but that'll be quite a bit harder you know so send out some other cards you know if there's a financial advisor day you know might want to send out a financial advisor oh you know april 15th tax day send it out to your all your accountant uh, clients there you go <laughs> so what you want to do is uh, also make these bets when you're trying to decide something with others let's say you are the co-founder of a tech startup and the other co-founder you have a disagreement about something you have a disagreement about some nature let's say you have a disagreement about um, what will be the uh, funding for your company in the next round of angel investing and based on that disagreement like let's say you know he thinks the company will have three million in funding and you think it will have five million in funding cool that's a clear disagreement and right now you want to make a decision based on that assessment and who you bring on and how you frame you know. so in your budget plan for going forward you want to integrate this information so what i would advise you to do is make a bet for some of your own money let's say a thousand dollar bet from him and a thousand dollar bet from you and he says three million you say five million and whoever's number is closest to the final number you actually go forward and you say that okay you know that person won the bet and we'll trust that person's estimates more from now <laughs> So let's say if the final assessment from if the final numbers from the angel investors come in at 4.5 million, you know, you're going to be closer to reality and you'll trust your money, uh, your assessments more going forward. And as for the budget, I would just suggest you average that and say, you know, we'll assume 4 million, but then in the future adjust based on whose assessments tend to be better. So the same sort of betting can be used for usually lower stakes in smaller businesses or at lower levels of lower levels of an organization. So that's the fifth skill. Sixth skill, consider alternatives. So you want to consider alternative explanations and options. This is especially helpful for the confirmation bias. Um, let's say your boss is curt with your twerk. And, you know, usually she's not curt with your twerk, but this time she's curt with your twerk. Is she pissed at you? You know, should you start getting your resume and polishing it? You know, what what's going on? Uh, I've had coaching clients who fall into these sort of catastrophizing thinking, who think about, oh, the boss has cut with me at work. What did they do wrong? You know, they think about everything they do wrong. You know, oh, this thing, this thing, this thing. Maybe they're pissed because of this, and you know, they are, they tend to drive themselves at the wall. Not 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 a good thing. That's one of the things we work on. Not good. So what you want to do is consider alternative explanations and options. You know, maybe her lunch burrito didn't agree with her. Maybe she's rushing to fulfill some, you know, customer order or something like that. And she's just being curt because of that. So combine, consider, you're considering these alternative explanations and options. And then you're working to also combine it with the probabilistic thinking of launching an experiment. So you launch an experiment by approaching your boss later when you know she doesn't have anything going on. When it's a quiet moment, she's not worried about anything, and you see how she behaves. And then you update your beliefs based on this new information. You know, if she's nice and friendly towards you, nothing to worry about, don't need to polish your resume. It was just the situation. <laughs> so no need to worry about it. So in general, you want to try to find alternative evidence that, again, disconfirms your initial assumptions to fight the confirmation bias and many other cognitive biases that have to do with us giving in to initial assumptions and paying attention to what is right in front of us rather than something that's more important that we can't immediately see. And that's called attentional bias and there are many other cognitive biases. So it's crucial to decide in advance what kind of information would change your mind. So if the boss, if you approach her later and you assume that, hey, she's nice to you and she talks to you as she usually does, that would change your mind. For a team decision making, this is especially important to decide what will change your mind in advance because what evidence would count as good enough because you don't want to go into a team decision making situation without having that evidence in decision in advance so that other people aren't shifting the goalposts. Decide what would change your mind, what would change their mind and consider these alternatives and then launch experiments to figure out what is actually the case. You know, let's say you might be hesitant to hire someone. You as part of the decision-making committee might be hesitant to hire someone because you're not quite sure that she's the greatest fit for the role. 
you know, take her on on a three month internship and decide in advance what kind of goals does she have to hit for her to be brought on full time. So that's an example of where you consider alternative explanations and options, and that's an alternative option. The previous one was an alternative explanation, and that way you succeed effectively by seeing whether she actually works out or not. So that's an effect, very effective strategy. The, what I mentioned before about doing the merger and acquisition, launching the experiment the, of having a short-term collaborative project is the alternative option. That's an alternative option to the option of immediate merger. And that tends to be much more effective than if you just do the merger because that initial information, that alternative option, when you get that information, it will help you make a much more effective decision going forward. So one thing that to keep in mind in considering alternative options is that we tend to generate many less options than we should in making decisions. This happens at all sorts of places, you know, all sorts of problems. We tend to generate many, many less options than we should, even in really important decisions. You know, so when you look at the news and you see that a CEO has been fired for, let's say, has been at the company for a year or less than a year, that means that the board likely didn't consider nearly enough options when they were considering that CEO hire. And you know, they let's say they had one groomed CEO who they just brought on as opposed to considering alternative CEOs. And that CEO didn't work out partially because they didn't think about all the options and the CEO was arrogant and thought that she was you know, the be all and end all and wouldn't get fired and that got fired, not good. <laughs> okay, so next one, consider your past experience. It really helps as a debiasing strategy, especially for the planning fallacy when we tend to assume everything will go according to plan. Now, do you know people, are your person, who tends to leave for a meeting that's 15 minutes away, exactly 15 minutes in advance, not thinking about problems like, you know, you forgetting your car keys or forgetting your phone or there being traffic on the way or something like that, that causes you to be delayed. Not great. So an easy way of thinking about that is think about your past experiences and see whether leaving 15 minutes in advance for a meeting that's happening 15 minutes away has been always effective. You know, it's going to be much less stressful for you if you leave 25 minutes in advance, you give yourself that room and you, let's say you arrive five minutes early because you were delayed for five minutes because you needed to you know, get some gas. And that's going to be much more effective going forward. And that works for everything. So for example, if you're, um, there was a company that I worked with that was constantly underestimating the time that it would cost to do building projects. It was a building company. They were underestimating, underestimating the time that previous construction projects took and especially at the end of the project. So we had them work on estimating the previous construction projects and building that into new bids and new evaluations of how long a certain construction project would take. And that resulted in them having much more realistic assessments, much more realistic internal assessments of how much time a, const a construction project would take. So that's another example on a much bigger scale than being late. Skill eight, considering the future. Think about the long term and the repeating scenarios. So this is what it, think the, what it leads to. Think about the long term of whatever is going on in the situation and think about what would happen in repeating scenarios if this scenario repeated over and over again in the future whether it's one big decision or a series of repeating scenarios. Now, what happened when the last, what happened the last time you asked your colleague to help you, let's say, finish a report by, you know, by Monday? Let's say you're, it's Wednesday and, and you, you asked them to help you finish by Monday, your colleague agreed, you know, did he carry out your commitment or did he just avoid you for the next couple of days and pretend that nothing happened? Did this happen more than once? Why are you asking him again? <laughs> you know, you can have a frank conversation with your colleague and say, hey, you know, what's going on? I noticed this pattern. This is a problem. Let's talk about it. Or if you don't want to have that conversation because, you know, you don't want to have the emotional labor of addressing the situation, you can just ask other colleagues and not work with this person anymore. Just let it slide. This kind of evaluation can really help you improve your business relationships, your ways of going for forward into the future. 
Now, a really helpful approach here for that's kind of a repeating scenario for long term scenarios, you want to think about what ha will happen in the situation a day from now, a month from now and a year from now. Let's say you're anxious about making a sales call. It's natural to be anxious about making a sales call. Most of us are anxious about making a sales call. So you think about what will happen a day from now. You know, you might still have some anxiety from that call, but you'll have made the call. You'll have succeeded in making the call, you know, and uh, let's say you're making 10 calls and, you know, on average that two of your calls get returned. So let's say you know, two of your calls get returned. You get uh, two hits out of 10 calls. You're still feeling some stress the next day. What will happen a month from now? You know, I can guarantee to you that the stress from making the sales calls a month ago will have yeah, it all have disappeared. And maybe one of those people will have turned into an actual sale. And what will happen a year from now? Well, who knows? That person might turn out to be, you know, one of your best clients. And that's how you think about the month, day from now, month from now, year from now consideration. Skill nine, consider other viewpoints. You probably heard the saying, before you judge someone, walk a mile in their shoes. That's a very good saying. You, what you need to do is understand other people's mental models and the situational context. We tend to underestimate the extent to which other people agree with us, uh, disagree with us. So we tend to think that other people agree with us much more than they actually do. That's called the false consensus effect. So we have a false idea of a consensus between us and them. So one way to address that is the golden rule, to treat others like the way you want to be treated, but that's not the best way of treating, uh, of addressing it. Because the way you want to be treated may not be the way other people want to be treated. So for example, my wife uh, and business partner, Agnes, she doesn't like surprises and I really like surprises. So in the beginning of our relationship, I was surprising her a lot and she was upset and I didn't realize why she was upset until we sat down and talked about it. It took me a while to stop trying to surprise her and still happens occasionally when I forget that she's so different from me. But you want to figure out the ways that people are different than you and treat them not according to the golden rule, but the platinum rule. The platinum rule says that you should treat other people the way they want to be treated. So figure out how other people want to be treated and figure and treat them that way. You'll get much better relationships and have much less relationship disasters in your professional life and personal life, like with Agnes, if you figure out and apply the platinum rule. So skill 10, use an external perspective. You know, when was the last time you saw your, two of your colleagues arguing about something minor and nonsensical, perhaps lubricated by some alcohol after you know, post event, uh, post work event at a bar somewhere? You know, I saw that happen just a few days ago. It's a pretty common thing. Why does that happen? Why do they tend to argue about something really kind of nonsensical or minor? Um, like, why, why does that happen? Well, it's because they have the inside view. They don't look at the situation from the outside and see that the argument is kind of stupid, not helpful, will cause more resentments and it will cause more frustrations. So you don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to be that colleague. The inside view within the situation blinds us to the broader context of what's going on. So what you want to do is take an external perspective. Look at the situation from the outside, the external perspective, not the inside view and the outside view. We talked about the outside view in the context of the base rate probability. This is a different sort of outside view where you look at the external perspective on the situation and you think about, well, what would a person who is making a good judgment in this situation do. Think about it that way. The least, this is the quickest but least reliable method. You basically step outside of yourself. You think about what would a person with good judgment do? Another way of asking that is, what would I recommend a friend to do in this sort of situation? You know, so what would you recommend a friend to do when they got um, email tell from a subordinate telling them that a, a deal, that a major deal may not happen? What would you recommend? You would probably wouldn't recommend the friend to yell at the subordinate and go and uh, shatter the other party either. Uh, however, if at all possible, it's much more effective to get an external perspective from somebody else, not from yourself, especially from people who have the opposite kind of intuitive tendencies than you do. So if you have the fight response like I do, look at somebody who has the fight response. If you have the 
So if you have the optimism bias, which means you tend to be risk blind and you think everything will go hunky dory, look for someone who has a pessimism bias, who is risk averse and who thinks things will not go well. Fortunately, my business partner, Agnes, fulfills that function for me. I tend to be very optimistic. I think that tend to think that everything will go well. And I always need to fight that. So I try to, whenever Agnes is not around or it's something like really minor, I take the external perspective on myself and say, okay, decrease my optimism, decrease my expectations, probably not going to go as well as I think. But when Agnes is around, and especially if it's something more significant, I make sure to run it by her. So try to run it by someone who you trust and who has your back and who has uh, some of your the opposite tendencies that you have. Now, if this is an important question where expertise is relevant, let's say a legal question or any other sort of question where there's specific people who have that specific expertise, run it by an expert. Ask that person. Have them give you their input. You know, whether it might be a coach or consultant or someone like that. It might be a service professional, like I said, a lawyer or financial matter. You might want to talk to an accountant or someone like that. That will really help you fight that especially the external perspective really helps you fight the confirmation bias where you tend to again go with look for information that confirms your beliefs as opposed to the right information so next one setting a policy it's one of the easiest ways of addressing cognitive biases is to set a policy for yourself as an individual private policy or for your organization an internal policy to address problems in various specific ways so take certain steps, let's say uh, for your organization, you can make sure before any significant decision to have a structured decision-making process as part of that decision. And there's again going to be links linked in the episode show notes to the structured decision-making process that you can make as part of this. As part of this. So there are a number of structured decision-making processes that you can make whenever you start a new project, whenever you want to implement a decision, you want to prepare for a product launch, you want to do an internal process evaluation, strategic plan, have a structured decision-making process as part of that. Now that's for major decisions. For more minor decisions, something that I recommend to all of my coaching and consulting clients is to just have this five question guide, five question checklist, just to have it on your desk. So it's a very quick and easy effective checklist. So the first question is, what informa important information haven't I yet considered about this question? Second question, what dangerous judgment errors haven't I yet addressed? Third question, what would a trusted and objective external advisor suggest I do? Fourth question, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? And fifth question, what kind of information would cause me to change my mind? You can have an internal policy for your organization of always having that on your desk or having that as a poster and or having that as a poster in offices to make sure that people ask these questions. And for yourself in your personal life, like I said, I have this in my office, my personal office, not simply my organization office, and I just use this whenever I have a decision, everyday small minor decision in front of me, like about an email or a project or, you know, about to publish an article and I'm thinking about things or where, where to submit it. Or when I'm working with a client and I'm about to make a recommendation and it's kind of, I'm just use that to think about things and prevent serious problems going forward when I use that strategy. So the link to get this checklist and the blog with the checklist is going to be in the show notes. Now, skill 12, moving on to skill 12, which is a related skill. This is about making a pre-commitment. This is a specific kind of sort of policy, but it's different because what you're doing is you're making a public pre-commitment. So you're making a public and external policy, something that the broader public knows if you're in a company, or you're telling other people about a pre-commitment that you have made. So for example, let's say if you as a business join the Better Business Bureau, that means that you're pre-committing to their standard code of ethics, the 20 code ethics that are part of the Better Business Bureau. Or let's say that you as an individual professional are taking the ProTruth Pledge at ProTruthPledge.org. That means that you're committing to that set of 12 truth-oriented behaviors that gives you credibility in the same way that Better Business Bureau gives credibility for ethical behaviors to a business. Both of those involve a public statement with an accountability mechanism. And that's a very effective strategy to make sure that you stick to that statement as opposed to going 
with your gut and intuitions, which often cause you to want to make, take shortcuts in your ethics and morals. Yeah, that's, that's just how it happens. You know, ethics and morals were created because that's not the way that we would naturally behave if we go out of gut. Or, for example, you make a pre-commitment to you know, make a Facebook post and say, you know, I pre-commit to you know, losing 20 pounds by you know, three months from now, or I will send a donation of $100 to you know, the Democratic Party if you're a Republican or the Republican Party if you're a Democrat, for example. And that's, again, a pre public pre-commitment where you're making a statement and you're backing it up by money. So that's another way of making a pre-commitment that's quite effective. So that's a really effective strategy to address any sort of problems that you are likely to fall into when you want to engage in a certain praiseworthy behavior, but you're struggling to make sure that you commit to that behavior. So, this is the set of 12 behaviors that I want to talk about. I hope that they have been helpful for you and they will be helpful for you when, as you integrate them into your behaviors to address the confirmation bias and the over 100 other cognitive biases that cause us to make really bad decisions that result in disasters for our businesses, our relationships, and our personal life, our health, and so on. My goal always is to provide you with outstanding value in making good decisions. And I hope that this video has, and I hope that this episode has helped you do so. I hope that you've gotten that value and learning about these 12 mental skills will indeed provide you with what you're looking for. And I want to hear from you. In the show notes, share whether it will or it does or it will provide you with that value. What do you think of these 12 mental skills? Where might you use them? How might you use them? How might you integrate them into your life? How might you integrate them into your company? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Now remember, there's going to be a blog with all of this information linked in the episode notes. And the blog will have much further information and will go much more in depth on these 12 mental skills. This is kind of more of an overview video, even though, as you can see, it's quite long because it's 12 skills and it's hard to integrate and adopt. Now, then I want you to also take a look at the other blogs linked in the show notes to the five key questions, the structured decision-making processes, and the 30 cognitive biases that I mentioned. Click like if you like this episode. Share this episode with others, people you care about, to help them avoid disasters in their personal lives and in their professional lives, in their businesses. Share it with others in your business, in your organization, to help the organization as a whole avoid business disasters. Make sure to subscribe to avoid missing future content from the making why from the wise decision maker show. And follow me on social media to make sure that you get not simply the wise decision maker show content updates, but all other content that I create that's outside of the show. There's blogs, there's books, there's lots of webinars and so on. And I also curate useful information that other people create. So you'll get useful information from them as well. You can learn much more about this in my book on these topics and how to avoid the confirmation bias and other cognitive biases and make the wisest decisions in business settings. It's called Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Business Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Now, the best free resource I can offer you is to sign up for my Wise Decision Maker course. There will be, again, a link in the episode notes for how you can sign up. And I really hope to see you on the next episode of The Wise Decision Maker Show. The wisest decisions to you, my friends.